is the 1st of February 2020 and we've just realised Brexit. Net flixes the king. Four parts of Shakespeare's Henriade starts with Richard II, Henry IV, Henry IV again, two parts, and then we have Henry V, the greatest king that ever ruled this island, believe it or not. He didn't rule very long, I think it was about nine years, maybe. Trained, not just in English and in French, but in Latin, a competent theologian, believe it or not. He wasn't, he wasn't your run of the mill medieval king. By the time he was 16, he'd cut his teeth fighting in battles, especially in Wales, where he sustained a serious injury, an arrow going right through his head, right somewhere about there, going right through, and the arrowhead embedded in his skull. Now, some ironmonger had devised an instrument, ingenious instrument, with which to extract the arrowhead, without which we would not have had the legacy that we now have today, as portrayed in uh, Shakespeare's Henriade. There is a scene in Netflix's The King. This is where the bowmen, yeomen, show their faces with the English, in that ingenious longbow, the devilish longbow, with which they were about to decimate the French army. Plus the French army, heavy cavalry, heavy armour, noblemen who thought themselves superior to the English yeoman. And now, you know what a yeoman is. A yeoman is what we would have described, what we would describe as a butler, a senior house servant, a small farm owner, Effectively, simply a respected commoner. Now that scene is iconic and it is important for us to understand that without the impact of the yeoman bowman, Henry V would not have won Argincourt and effectively taken over Normandy. That would not have happened. We would have had a different kind of history. Now why is that important? One of the ironies of history is that when we remember things, like for example the Magna Carta, we think the Magna Carta was written for the freedom of ordinary peoples, and indeed it wasn't. The Magna Carta was written for the freedoms of noble men. I'm not even saying noble women. Noble men and church men. So I'm talking about the clergy, not the laity. So the clergy, people of power, people with landed interest. Let me tell you something that most people don't know about Henry the fifth. Henry the fifth is England's first English king since 1066. Every other king since William the Conqueror up until Prince Hal has sought to solidify their claims on French lands and on French power by consolidating power in England the entire 100 year war was about claims English kings had on French power or on the French throne. Many of the kings, in fact, up until how, would speak English as a second language. Some could not even speak English at all. At all. And the best, most famous example is Richard the Lionheart, who did not speak English at all. The official language, the royal court, the royal court, and the royal civil servants would have been French and had been French up until whom? Prince Hal. Up until Henry V. And his preference, even though he could speak three languages fluently, I believe, his preference was to speak English. At the very least, he could speak French fluently. His preference was to speak English. The documents, or the official language of the court also became English. It is in Hal that we begin to see a sense of English identity begin to form. With the Black Death decimating 30% of England's population, Wales, Scotland, um, and, and not just that, with the victory of these yeomen, these ordinary, uh, uh, simple, um, but, but well-respected commoners, 
you have a force of history finally forcing the issue. Magna Carta could no longer be seen as something that, that, that preserved the rights of just nobles or of the church. The forces that shaped this country were unique. And I don't say this lightly at all. Several in, in the history of human civilization, there's certain groups of people that face unique challenges and the unique challenges creates unique phenomena. Japan is another very good example of unique circumstances creating unique phenomena as happened quite a few times in Japan's history. The idea of the nation state is one of those, is one of those, it's one of those events in human history that you could describe as a miracle. And this is, there's a reason why I say this. I think the idea of a nation state is so brilliant, it could not have been invented by a human being. So let me say that again. I think the idea of a nation state is so brilliant, it could not have been invented by human minds. So the two things here that you could, you could summarize, you could, you could say it, it came from the minds of angels. So when I say angels, I mean God or, or the like. So it either came from the minds of angels or by happenstance. Now we had similar, similar forces on the European mainland, but there's a problem with Henry VIII deciding to pull out from Rome and creating the Church of England, another <laughs> unique um, British solution to European problems. It's not new. What's happening with Brexit is not new. Um, in mainland Europe, where there is still a, a, a papal universal authority, which in itself impeded the natural forces that were that would have cons consolidated ethnic groups, cultural groups into nation state entities. That was happening naturally. But the papacy in itself, and this is not deliberate, the papacy wasn't trying to do something evil, or I'm, I'm gonna stop nation states from forming or coalescing. No, it wasn't that. It was that they saw themselves in a common papal union. And so that stopped people creating a more local identity. But in England, Scotland, Wales, not so. Because this island began to create a different kind of narrative by necessity. People really don't create narratives by design. Very, very rare. We tend to create narratives because it is necessary to create narratives. We create culture because it is necessary to create culture. We don't create culture because we're bored. We create culture because we kind of have to. We have no choice, actually. The way I define culture is I define culture as, as a problem-solving device. Every iteration of culture is an answer to a problem. Culture tries to answer questions posed by problems. But then culture in itself is a facade. That's what I mean by it's a, it's, it's a facade. It is superficial. When people, when people try to, try to create iterations of themselves in cultural norms, they're trying to tell you a story. So essentially, when you're talking about culture, you're talking about the narratives or the narrative arc of a people. This is why the British have a particular narrative arc that is very, very particular to an island people that have experienced the ravages of time that could only have been experienced by island people. 
in this case a very small one, and relatively primitive, such that several other powers thought it easy pickings. And over 200, 300, 400, 400 years, people have to find a way to respond to those pressures and to those forces. All sorts of languages, some more civilized than others, some more cultured than others, some more influenced by Rome and other older cultures than others. And, but with the ravages of time, there's an adjusting, there's a movement of the Teutonic plates. Forces are unleashed. Things begin to meld by force or without. And so you have a, kind, a story that's fairly unique, kind of European, but not quite European. You know, they look European, but they don't quite behave European. That's because of the containment, not just in, in the sense of the island itself, because narrative and land go together. The behavior of a land, its texture, its moisture, and these things form how people think of themselves, how they form a language, how they use language, how they name their children. And so the, the concept of the nation state is not something any human being, I don't care how brilliant you are, could have sat down and come up with. You, we, we, we had the, the, uh, the invention of, uh, of the city-state going back probably 10,000 years. But there hasn't been very much uh, development since then. So by the, by the end of the 1400s, with Henry V becoming England's first English king, what you have here is, is the beginning of a national identity. This is one of the reasons why, and you have to wonder, why did Shakespeare write four plays, <laughs> you know, on really one, one guy? Because, because Richard II is merely a setup. Richard II sets up the usurper king, Henry, son of John Gaunt. So he sets, he sets Henry IV up, the usurper, and, and, and then, but really, it's to set up how the, the, the great king himself, who in, in nine years had done more than any king before him. More than any king before him. And if, you, if, if, if you want to talk about the greatness of the English nation, this is my guess. If you, talk, if you want to talk about the, if you want to talk about the nexus of English greatness, I am going to go to Prince Hal, I am going to go to this most pious king, Henry the Fifth. What you have with the amalgamation of Scotland and England, two very strong parliaments by 1600s, stronger than any parliament on mainland Europe. And one of the reasons why, again, we have uh, this, this accidental coalescing of a nation state was because you had two strong national identities symbolized by the church. So you have the Protestant church in, the, the, you have the church in Scotland and then you have the church in England and its parliaments deciding to come together as, what would you call it? No one quite knew what it was. It was a partnership. Because if we, if we don't get into a partnership here, the Spanish and the Portuguese are going to roll, roll right over us. So, so they create this enterprise. It's more of a business cooper, cooperative sort of like an um, enterprise. But what you have in the end is this like-minded twin nations with shared history, diabolical at times, and sometimes sublime, coming together to create what you might describe as a political miracle. And I say it's a political miracle because it could not have been planned. What happened is you have a nation of nations. It's not artificial. An artificial one would be a top down, sort of like um, evolution. But what you have is a bottom up. People intermarrying, people with a common language, people with a similar cultures. Yes, it's different, but the same. You know what I mean? different but the same. And so you have that tension 
that tension of these two to making each other better. It's kind of like the idea of the com communitas. We have a little village and every time a young person comes of age, in this case, a, a young man comes of age, they'll send him, kick him out. So he goes out into the world and he comes back a few weeks, a few months, a few years later, and he's bringing back some of the stuff that he, he encountered in a strange world. But when you do that over several generations, your tribe just keeps getting stronger because you keep bringing in new ideas. So this is what you have here. You have this tension between these two that are the same but different. You know, the same but at the same time very different in certain things. But when, when, when you have them both working together, then you have a synergy and that tension creates a furnace through which things are purified. The chaff just gets burnt away. All you have is gold. 300 year miracle. 300 year political miracle, which is what created the empire, by the way. I said to a relative of mine, and a relative of mine also said to me, two different people, I said to a relative of mine, when we, when we leave the EU and we begin to see ourselves as a nation again, and it's different from how we, of course we saw ourselves as a nation. We were a nation amongst nations in a top down sort of like relationship. So, so the entire structure and project was designed from the top, designed to propagate downwards. If you want an effective narrative, what you want is you want it to come from the bottom up. Now, it's how do you do that? Anyone's guess, right? Um, you just get lucky, as in Brazil's case, is Samba and football. But there was always Samba there. And uh, the football was an expression of Samba. You know, Jinga, uh, you know, Brazilian football was an expression of, of Samba in itself. At the same time, its essence was grassroots. So this is very dif different from the European project. Its essence isn't grassroots. This is why there will always be a schism. This is the reason why, why its peoples will always be ill at ease with the project. They might go along with it, but they will always be ill at ease with it because it is not a grassroots project. So I said to my relative, I said, um, when this, when this nation finally breaks free of the EU, of the EU project, um, our language will change. <laughs> you see, what are you talking about? The language will change. Remember what I said to you about culture? Culture, the iterations of culture are merely expressions of solutions to questions posed by problems. In this case, we have left and we now, we now need to stand on our two feet and find ways of describing what that looks like. That will affect how we think about each other. It will affect what we say about each other and how we describe ourselves. That's what culture is. What is culture? Culture is, who am I? What am I? What do I think about who I am? What do I expect or where do I expect myself to be in 10 years, 20 years, and in a generation, two generations time? And what do I want others to think about that? That's what culture is. So you're, you're trying to answer those questions. In the end, you, you come, you're, you're talking about narratives. Now, when we have left the EU, you think we're not asking those questions, even if you even if you're doing it, uh, you know, unconsciously or subliminally. Of course you are. And so of course language will change. Uh, the, the the other thing uh, an, another relative said to me was, um, it's as if, and this is what he's saying as a son of of African origin, he, born here. He was saying it's as if we have more confidence than the Brits 
having themselves. When he's saying when he says Brits, he's talking about those who have been who who have been here for several generations. Effectively, effectively whites. So it's as if it's as if we have more confidence in them than they have in themselves. And I say, yeah, we've been saying this for years. You know, when the defeatist, defeatist um, uh, 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 posture, orientation that it, that the Brits have about themselves is astonishing. I mean, many nations are sovereign. They just, they trade openly by themselves. Why do we have to be trapped? And this is not, this is not a trading block. This is, this is a political federalist project. And so an ever closer union is effectively trying to recreate a, a European empire. But the age of empire is dead and it's gone. For those who want to create empires, I say good luck with your empire building. Empires tend to be wasteful, they are tyrannical, and they don't last very long. Nation states, however, last and they stand the test of time. So I, I say empire building is for mugs. <laughs> Let the Chinese and, uh, and, and, and Europe do their empire building now with the Americans. Let them all go do their empire building. Let's let's not have any of that. This country has done it, been there, done that, bought the t-shirt and decided to uh, abdicate effectively. The guarantor of individual liberty. And by the by the way, yeah, the 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 libertarian ideal is it's holy. I, mean, I know some will say it's a it's European I No, 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 no. The, the, when you talk about classic liberalism, you're talking about John Locke. It's an, it's an English idea. You think it's an accident that several libertarian and liberal ideas and concepts, freedom of speech, uh, ownership rights, you know, when they say that, you know, an Englishman's home is his castle, all that kind of stuff, you think that's by accident? Everything trickles downhill from the concept of nation, nation state. The guarantor of human liberty is the nation state. The nation state is based on the common values of a people. Sometimes you, come, you might say it's an ethnic group, but then it goes further than an ethnic group. It's common language. But then it goes further than common language, common values, common history, common culture, common expectations. Sounds very much like a family to me. When we talk about ethnic groups, you're thinking about the original word in terms of etymology. So you're talking about ethnos, which is the Greek word. Um, where we get um, our idea of ethnic from. But really, really when it's translated in the Bible, for example, it's translated as nations, right? So this is where we get our idea of nation state from, right? So we're borrowing all these words. So nation is really a translation from ethnos. So when we think of the British people, we're thinking of something that's more like a family than a PLC, which is what some of the elite would like us to think of our country as. It's always about the bottom line, about GDP. But sometimes families want to, uh, uh, how would I put it, offload? Sometimes families want to downsize because downsizing is best for the welfare of that family. And in this case, people have said nobody voted to lose their jobs and nobody voted to be poorer. And as a Brexiteer, I would say, yes, we did. I voted to be richer or poorer. I voted to leave the EU for better or for worse. So 
it got me thinking when people say that when we voted to leave the EU, it exposed a racist underbelly and xenophobic um, character of the British people. I, I just find that ridiculous, mind blowingly ignorant. That's for people who don't even know themselves. Of all the countries in Europe, the country that's least likely uh, to become fascist and the least xenophobic of all has to be the United Kingdom. Take it from someone who should know. Because, you know, and I'm, I'm pretty sure, uh, along with many of my friends, um, black men like me, especially when we were younger, back in the day, coming back uh, to Heathrow, thinking in our minds, back to civilization. We just never said it to anyone. And then I'm saying, oh, that's what I think. Is that what you think? Yeah, that's what I think too. And we'll just say, whoa, that's what I think too. Welcome back to civilization. Because it's the one place except when you go back to the homeland or the United States. Now take this from me, the three places where I think as a, as a black man, yeah, the, the, the ceiling is theoretically limitless. That's Nigeria, that's the United Kingdom, and then the United States. That's it. Everywhere else, there will be a label that is more profound than anything else that I am. We know that in Europe. We know when we when we're coming back home, we know the difference. Alan Sugar tweeted out something a few years ago that people thought was beyond the pale, where he showed a picture of blacks, maybe Senegalese or something, selling trinkets on the beach, and in this case it was Italian. Well, you know, and he, I think it's the French when the French were, won the World Cup, and he was talking about the leap from that to, to this. Uh, people uh, lost their top because of that. I mean, I'm just thinking, okay, yeah, for me it was funny, but I get it. I get why, why people lost their rag, but, but they don't know what they're losing their rag about. There's an irony there in Lord Sugar's picture. Shall I tell you what the irony is? It's an irony that you probably don't, can't even suspect. So let me tell you what the irony is. That picture could exist in the United Kingdom. Hmm. Have you ever seen young black men selling trinkets in Oxford Street? Have you seen them selling them on the beaches of Brighton or Blackpool? Have you seen strings of immigrant, dark-skinned, tall, lean young men selling beads? and all sorts of paraphernalia, utterly useless. Have you seen that in this country? When you go into central London, or you go into any big city, do you see enclaves for white people? Can you tell when you're in a black neighborhood or when you're in a white neighborhood just by looking at the buses, just by looking at the street signs, just by looking at the houses? Can you tell in this country? No, you can't. No, you can't. So don't tell me. Don't tell me anything about this country. There's an underbelly of xenophobic racism. What a crock. Seems Hitler knows a bit more about what it means to be British than some of you lot. Seeing as he just took it for granted, this country could never be fascist. There's no point even bothering trying to brainwash them. They'd rather give up their country, see it go up in smoke, than become fascist acolytes. It's a disgrace that some of our most intelligent, well-educated people would even think to hawk this nonsense. The British mentality, in its most primitive posture, is incompatible with fascism. The British mentality in its most docile and passive form is incompatible with fascism. Remember what I said about the nation state? 
the forces of history, time, happenstance, circumstance that forces a people to come to certain solutions by design or just because they have to, right? That's the reason why it is impossible for the British mind to be to find any kind of common ground with fascism. It's incompatible with the British sense of being. And there is a British sense of being. One that's been forged over a thousand years. What you would think is common in Europe, and there's a reason why it's common in Europe, a different kind of history. You see, fascism could only be designed by a people who created the machine. It's born out of industrialization. It's born from the machine. You can't find that kind of philosophy birthed organically anywhere. You will not find it anywhere. You will find it organically birthed in the places where the invention of the machine finds its source. Now, I'm not saying the British did not invent the machine. Of course they did. But there's something that the British have experienced that blunted that force. Is the story, that story that creates, that creates the nation state, is that story. That story blunts what would naturally have come forth from the invention of the machine. The invention of the machine, it's almost like you are inspired and you copy the machine. That's the predictable and predicted movements. There is no chaos. And the whole aim of, of, a, of a fascistic enterprise is to create predictability, exactitude, exactness, measurability, atomized understanding, utter and complete understanding, because the machine can be so understood why not this biological machine, the human being? But the reason why the Brits can't go that way is because the British, because, because British narrative blunts that natural response to the machine in that way. We have a very different response to the machine. It's a kind of, it's a kind of response that, that, that Natsume Soseki, this is, this is J Japan's Shakespeare, it's the kind of response he has to industrialization, to Japan's industrialization. The same kind of response. It's kind of like John Locke's response to the same phenomena, which is, which is to fight against the machine. So whilst fascism is an iteration of the machine, British liberalism is anti-machine. This is the reason why the Brits can't be fascist. It's not because they're any more special than anybody else. Not because they're burned from angels or whatever. No. It's because its history imposes itself on the British mind. It doesn't... Look at this. It doesn't just impose itself on the British mind. It imposes itself on people who speak that language too. Whoa. The history imposes itself also on people who speak that language because the language is formed from the experience. I think for some of you, it's pictures, there's a picture forming as I say these things. So you, so you know why I say our removal our exiting the Euro Imperial project affords us the capacity to begin to develop new language. Ways of talking about ourselves without which we would not have had access to. To my mind, Our adventure in the EU project had blunted 
our progress and probably accelerated our decline. Whew. That's a bit of a bombshell there. I, I think our participation in the EU project blunted our vision, our sense of ourselves, and accelerated our decline. This country has been in decline since the fall of empire. Very slow and steady decline. But I think we can arrest that. I think there have been bumps here and there, and sometimes it's been arrested for a decade, two decades. And sometimes we've actually moved out of the, the, that downward trend. But that long-term downward trend, I think, is still there. But when you have the creation of a new enterprise, suddenly people are bursting with ideas. And it's one of the reasons why I say for the naysayers, I think it's time for us to stop saying nay and start saying yay. What does this mean? Let's start finding solutions to problems rather than keep citing the problems. You know, we're going to be X amount billion poorer. We're going to be... Let's... Because no one can know that, right? Unless if you're clairvoyant, no one can know that. And even if you're clairvoyant, you can't prove it. So the future is there for us to write as a people. You have been furnished with people, peoples from different lands, different countries and places. I, for example, of Nigerian heritage, my, my mother came here in the 60s, loved this country, loved the queen. My father came here, respected this country. What he saw was, these guys make things work. I want to know how they do it so I can take it back to Nigeria and do the same thing. That's, that's what my dad wanted to do. My mom ra would rather have stayed here. She didn't just like the fact that these guys could make things work. She also appreciated the culture. And I think she wanted a melding of her culture and an English sensibility. She wanted that melding. When you do that, it gets better. You know, when people talk about diversity is our strength, what a load of rubbish. Diversity is your strength. What does that mean? That is a mantra. And you only say that because you're brainwashed. Doesn't mean anything. <laughs> so I said sky is blue. What? What does that mean? Nothing. Diversity is our strength. Doesn't mean anything. You ever remember the you heard the, the tale of the Tower of, of, of Babel, right? That's the enterprise you are trying to sell. When you talk about diversity is our strength, you're building you're building an edifice for no reason. No purpose, no agenda, no vision, no scope, no end date in sight, no plan. That's what diversity is our strength means, nothing. Your building will come crashing down. Diversity is not our strength the way you have said it. What you have is, is the pulling of the diversity to become the one. So you have Nigerians, Bangladeshis, Indians, Polish, Romanians, and the like, with the English, Scots, the Irish, and we all pull together as one people. Of course, of course, on the edges of this structure, you will have variations of colors and the like. But as you get to the nexus, to the center, to the core of the structure, you will have a solid nexus, dynamic, vibrating with life. But they're not disparate parts, all in the little ghetto boxes, because that's what it means. Diversity is our strength. What it really means is the mainstream will, be re will remain in the mainstream. You just stay in your little box and shut up. That's what it means. But what I'm selling here isn't that nonsense. What I'm selling here is a diversity in the one. Diversity in the one. So we all pull together as an entity, as a family. That means common goals, common value, common language. What's the point coming here if you just don't want to assimilate? What's the point? 
What's the point? There's no point whatsoever. If you're going to come here to this country, then you're going to learn to love the people. You're going to learn to love their language. You're going to learn to love their ways. Of course, there will be some things that you find despicable. Of course, every people have despicable things. But at the same time, there's much to love. And then you now bring your stuff. Bring it to the table. Because all these other cultures that are here have wonderful ways of thinking about what it means to be a human being. And you put that on the table. And then we mix that together and we get something better. It's still British, but it's better than it was before. Because that's how Britain got to be great. It got to be great because of the disparate peoples who were here, forced by the forces of nature, time and history to become a people. That's why they got the way they were. That's why they got so creative and resourceful. Here we are. It's as though history is repeating itself in a cycle. I say, let's forget this nonsense so sourced by people who are angry about something else. In some cases, daddy, especially. Forget that nonsense. The narrative of anger and retribution and of victimhood. Nonsense. There are no victims here. There is a family. Different parts, different views, different cultures. And we're saying... There is a core value. The core value is a British one and it is older than the ones that we're bringing in. As in, it is older in this place. So we assimilate and the core should, and this is the responsibility of the core, because the responsibility is not just those of us who have been here in the last 60 years. Responsibility also is of those of you who've been here for a thousand years which is to open up your hands and receive. But, not that it's a diversity is our strength sort of nonsense. It is that it becomes a new way of being British, not in diversity, but in the one. That is the core assimilates the new and we have a bigger, reinvigorated, tougher, stronger, shinier, newer core more relevant to the challenges of the times. This country has changed since the 1980s. Not the same country. Not the same country. For people to keep talking about this country as though it were the same country in the 1980s is disingenuous at best. This country is not the same country that it was in the 1960s. To continue to talk about this country as though it was the same in the 1960s is disgraceful. If they're incremental improvements, they must be acknowledged. But the improvements are not just incremental, they are, they are geometric. The improvements are geometric. I said, what do you say to my proposal? Which is, let's be a family. Let's not be a UK PLC, machine language. China in, China out, GDP, bottom line. Not that nonsense. How about we think of ourselves as a family? And this is a family enterprise. How about that? And how about we say the mother tongue, the mother culture, right? It's like a receptacle and receives and mixes all the other newbies. And then the gunk, old gunk, new gunk is churned out and we have cream left. How about that? Cream is better than what it was before. It's sturdier, it will last the ravages of time because it keeps taking in new blood and becomes a better one. Not a diversity is our strength mantra.
for my own. I have high hopes for this country. When you look at the landscape of time, it seems to suggest a cyclic capacity. And I, for one, I do not read history as though it's a, a collection of accidents. I believe in providence. Some of you know me as a, as a Bible teacher who teaches on, uh, from time to time on Radio 4, sometimes BBC 2, Sunday service, daily prayers and all that kind of stuff. I would rather talk about art and, uh, and theology, maybe philosophy, than talk about politics. But we have a once in a lifetime event here of which I am, a, I am privileged to be a part. And that privilege is to see a nation reborn. For all my artist friends, virtually none of whom supports the Brexit project. Many of my 2080 stablemates, long uh, age old friends, colleagues, great people, um, who can only look at this project with disdain. I say, I say join us. To all those angry people out there who are determined to think of this country as a racist, a fundamentally racist country, you have got to be kidding, right? You really have to be kidding. Very few of you would know anything about the depression that occurred in Ghana, so this is in the 80s, and lots of Ghanaians went to Nigeria. Ethiopia, Ethiopians went also to Nigeria. Nigeria's economy was booming back then. But with increasing pressures on infrastructure and the rest of it, and a never ending flow of Ghanaians coming in. And you've got to remember, Ghanaians speak English too, right? Maybe even better English than Nigerians. This is the irony, right? Um, they start getting abuse from Nigerians. I mean, I never heard of violence, but people were making fun of them, including Ethiopians. In, in South Africa today, the influx of Nigerians, I mean, many of you know what Nigerians are like. Nigerians just have no fear. They, um, again, this is again about story. This is how stories shape the cosmological um, posture of a people. They have a sense of themselves, an ontological sense of themselves framed in the, in the forge of time. And Nigerians just seem to think mm, there is no obstacle to me being successful. So they just go into South Africa and they get successful in the, in, in, in the, in the United States. The mo probably the most successful immigrant um, in class in, in, in the United States. More successful than Koreans and Chinese. Poor. How did that happen? Anyway, they, they're getting killed and slaughtered along with white farmers in South Africa. So when people try to sell this as a white problem, they've got, they've got another agenda. Yeah? They've got another agenda. And that agenda is not in your own interest. I don't even think it's in theirs. Good night. And may the love of God reside with you all.